Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our weekly Redefining Medicine podcast. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Wade Cooper, the Medical Director of the University of Michigan Headache and Neuropathic Pains Clinic and Assistant Professor with the Departments of Neurology and Anesthesiology at the University of Michigan School of Medicine. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, for spending some time with us today. You will be speaking during the World Congress pre-conference workshop titled Pain and Cannabinoid Medicine Update this December. Can you share a little on the topic you will be discussing and why it's so important for clinicians to understand? I absolutely will because pain is incredibly important in the world we live in. We know that lots of patients have pain. Lots of family members have pain. Lots of people you know have pain. And pain comes in many different ideas and many different types. We know that some pain is visible. People who've broken arms, who've got a broken bone and wear a cast, that's a very visible illness. We know some pain is invisible. People with chronic migraine, people with fibromyalgia, people with chronic spine pain. And yet all of this pain impacts quality of life. We know that pain uh, from chronic headache, as an example, ranks up in the top five for years living with disability, according to World Health Organization. And what's amazing about this is that we still up until recently, didn't have a good understanding of what pain was. And now with some tremendous breakthroughs in research, tremendous breakthroughs in clinical patient care, we've learned that there's an inflammatory component to pain. We've understood better than ever these types of receptors in the body that respond to inflammation and propagate pain through the rest of the nervous system. And now we've got some phenomenal tools to help people who've got chronic pain, either visible pain, such as a broken arm or leg, or the invisible types of pain that we encounter so commonly in our clinical practice. On top of that, we're covering cannabinoid receptor functioning. And as everyone knows in the United States, cannabinoids have become incredibly popular. We also know that legally they've changed from being illegal in many countries to now cannabinoid therapy is approved in many states for medicinal use and actually improved uh, or approved for use in recreational purposes. So we're gonna be reviewing some of the receptors uh, related to cannabinoid functioning. We're gonna be talking about how these relate to pain processing, but also mood processing. And we're gonna talk about how to utilize them in clinical practice. Because as many people know, there's many different strains of cannabinoid targeted therapies from nutraceuticals and biological plants grown to help with this. And, And we're gonna be exploring all these types of topics. And this is very relevant to the patient care that we have in our clinics today. Will you share how you came to specialize in chronic headaches and centralized pain? I'd be happy to do so. It's kind of a circuitous path. Uh, At first in uh, undergraduate, I enjoyed science. I enjoyed working with people and had no idea how to blend those two together. Uh, Eventually applied to medical school, which I was convinced I wanted to be a primary care physician. And what I learned very quickly is that primary care physicians have to know so much about the entire body. And that became intimidating to me. So really, I went into neurology thinking I just had to know a little bit about the body, focused on nerves and brain, and that would be my area of interest. Well, when you come full circle, you realize that pain affects the entire body. And chronic pain, fibromyalgia, chronic migraine affects the gut. It affects our inflammation. It affects our hormones in our body. It affects our vasculature. And I've come to learn that all of these things play a role in being an excellent clinician for people who've got chronic pain. So I find myself running away from generalized medicine, searching for answers, and here I come back to looking at the big body again and looking for ways to help people in pain. Is there any particular research and or future advancements in this area you are most interested in seeing come to light in the coming years? There's many different areas that really excite us in the pain field. The first thing to focus on is the is the tremendous research we've seen that's led to fruitful treatments for our patients, working on CGRP receptors. For those who aren't familiar with CGRP, it's an inflammatory protein that's released on the surface of the brain, and it helps irritate and propagate migraine and post-traumatic headache and cluster headache to the rest of the nervous system. But that's just what it does in headache. 
We know that CGRP is located in peripheral nerves and is part of neuropathic pain in the rest of the body. We know that CGRP is involved with processing pain in the spine. But even besides that, CGRP is in almost every organ system. It's a vasodilator and plays a role in the lungs. It's involved with our inflammatory responses in our skin. It plays a role in regulating blood flow to our heart and to our brain, especially under times of duress and stress. And we've learned through science that we can harness the CGRP receptor and use specialized therapies that blunt this receptor from functioning and therefore improving chronic migraine, but the tease is out there for other pain syndromes. There's research being done with CGRP and fibromyalgia. There's research being done with CGRP and depression and chronic uh, mood disorders. And there's also uh, further evidence that outside of CGRP, other inflammatory peptides play a role in pain. And we're starting to learn how to take advantage of that understanding. So that's one area that I think is phenomenal. A second area that's really been a uh, fascinating pet interest of mine is the autonomic nervous system. How our blood pressure is regulated through our body, how our gut is told to function or stop functioning depending on what we're doing with our lives. But this has a tremendous impact in pain processing. We know that people with chronic migraine as an example are prone to have fainting episodes, prone to have funny heartbeats, prone to have a gut that's dysregulated either from motility or from absorption or from inflammation. And it's a two-way street. We know that if you cause pain, you have autonomic dysfunction. If you have autonomic dysfunction, you're more prone to develop pain throughout your lifetime. And we've also been able to learn how to help people with this overlap of neurologic syndromes. Things like sphenopalatine ganglion blocks, where you put numbing medicine in the back of the nose to turn off chronic pain, can also be helpful to regulate blood pressure in people who've got erratic blood pressures, to help stop inappropriate heartbeats in people who have inappropriate atrial tachycardia, and to help people who've got autonomic dysfunction in their gut and even peripheral autonomic dysfunction in their arms and legs, all from a four millimeter bundle that's located in the lining of your nose. Pretty cool stuff. Definitely. Recently in the news, we were reminded of just how much misunderstanding there is within the general public surrounding the DO accreditation. Will you share with us about your decision to take the doctor of osteopathic medicine route? Well, what a great question. Uh, when we think about um, the path to get into osteopathic medicine, for me, it was really a calling of integrative medicine or alternative medicine. Uh, allopathic medicine, uh, the alternative medical field uh, for physicians in this country is really based on systems so that you learn some basics of the body. And then many times you spe specialize into different organ systems. So you quickly become a pulmonologist, you quickly become an endocrinologist, and, and you kind of lose your focus on the whole body. Osteopathic medicine really embraces a whole body approach, understanding the integration of different body systems that make us whole. And that's really what stimulated me and excited me about going into the field of medicine. What I've also appreciated with my osteopathic colleagues is that it really takes all different types of people into the field. So many times my colleagues who are osteopathic physicians have variable backgrounds and weren't just research labs working their tail off studying mice when they were in undergrad, but have a very diverse clinical background. Uh, and for that, I'm very appreciative. Is there anything that you wish colleagues, medical students, or perhaps the general public understand more about being a DO? I would like them to understand that osteopathic physicians uh, have the same types of uh, education in many situations, same type of clinical background as other types of physicians in the United States. However, many times osteopathic physicians are willing to look at the big picture, looking for creative solutions for patients and are generally interested in the well-being of the people they take care of. And to me, that's a very important aspect of being an osteopathic physician. There are certainly osteopathic physicians who specialize in very specific aspects of medical care, but there's also osteopathic physicians who do whole body medicine from toe to the head and taking care of the entire family from a young child all the way up to the elderly. What changes and adjustments have you experienced as a clinician, as well as a clinical professor this year in light of COVID? Wow. So COVID has affected everyone in the world, we think. And especially for the patients I take care of in a headache program, we like to think of our patients as the um, uh, migraine warriors out there. People who've, even before COVID happened, had to cope with having chronic pain that was invisible, 
having a stigma that's not always understood by friends, by colleagues, by people that they interact with on a daily basis. But on top of that, we know that migraines are affected by stress. We know migraines are affected by sleep dysfunction. We know that migraines are affected by all kinds of environmental changes. When you throw that all together with COVID, where people have been stressed about their day-to-day -day activities, stressed about getting ill, stressed about how to take care of their family, how to, how to make ends meet for their family, worried about losing their jobs. Um, this has all had a tremendous impact in the patients we take care of. And we've seen that amplify someone's chronic pain, either in chronic migraine, in fibromyalgia, or other pain syndromes. On top of that, we know that access to care has been changed by COVID. In some ways, not so good. We know that COVID made people unable to get injections they require to maintain their pain processing. We know that COVID made it so it was hard for some people to get medications that they needed on a regular basis. But on the flip side, we know that COVID has led to telehealth, an explosion in ability for people to get access to care from the comfort of their own home. This has been huge for our practice because a lot of our patients come from really far away. So instead of having to travel for four or five hours, maybe get a hotel the night before for a visit to one of our practitioners, they can dial in from the comfort of their own home and get that same expert level of care delivered right to their doorstep. The other thing that we've seen about this uh, is that there's been a tremendous amount of support amongst patients with similar diseases, amongst providers reaching out to help patients, and as a community as a whole. And that's one of the best things I've been able to witness. I've been able to watch our patients succeed and rise from all kinds of challenges to really embrace what's important to them. And it's been a very fun journey to be part of. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper, for your time and your insight today. Uh, we'd also like to thank our listeners for joining Redefining Medicine, and we wish everyone a wonderful day. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.